welcome in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to introduce you to our new CC team who have come and joined me in youth ministry. CC stands for Cartoon Christians. Let's meet them. Hi, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the Cartoon Christians working with Bishop Hector Daniels today in the youth service. I hope that you're going to do your home studies, what will come up, throughout the service today. Hello, my name is Christine. Yeah, as you can see both me and Kevin are standing two meters away, keeping social distancing in mind. In these troubled times we asked you to stay safe and to keep your distance as you walk in your communities. We have to keep our faith in God, keep our prayers up look after our brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, uncles, neighbors, friends and everyone else in these troubled times. You'll meet the other two members of the team, Joanne and little Billy a bit later. It's time to go back to Bishop H and do the rest of this youth service. Okay, the bishop's giving me the smile, enjoy, and we'll see you again shortly. Always got a smile for you. Thanks, CCs. A question that has been asked. Is baptism the same as being christened? There is a long answer to this question, but I'm going to try and give you a shorter version. The major difference between baptism and christening stems from the way that the ceremonies are conducted. Baptism is the immersion in water of an adult or a young child in remission of their sins and the opening of commitment to Jesus Christ. Christening, on the other hand, is a sprinkling of water by the priest where the parents affirm the baby's commitment to Jesus Christ, as well as setting a full and proud name for their child. I hope that's answered the question. Now let's go and meet our prayer minister, Joanne. Hi, my name is Joanne. I'm your prayer minister today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how we thank and praise you for the young men and women who have trusted in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and we ask that you would work in the lives of all young people who have stepped out in faith in the Son of God. Draw ever closer to those who have made a commitment to you and we pray that they would grow in grace and in a knowledge of the Lord Jesus, in the days that lie ahead. May they learn to walk in spirit and truth and to trust in your word, knowing that your grace is sufficient for all their needs and requirements. Keep them, we pray, from being influenced by the tempting things of the world and the desires of the sin nature, and protect them from the wiles of the enemy who would seek to disrupt their walk with you, and fellowship with the Father, give them grace and wisdom as they face the challenges of life, and keep them humble, in heart and teachable in spirit and may they learn, to look to Jesus day by day knowing that without him, they can do nothing but in his strength he will lead and guide in all things. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for the words that you've just shared with us. Now that I'm feeling the Lord's power, let's do the history of the word. Our first word comes from the book of Titus. We know that the author of the book is the Apostle Paul. And we know that it's the 17th book in the New Testament. And it was written around 62 to 64 AD. Something else interesting about Titus. Did you know that he was a young pastor? That had been given the charge of the church of Crete. Paul wrote to encourage him and to address some of the same problems with leading a church as he had addressed with Timothy 
his young disciple. One of the interesting verses coming from Titus is in chapter 3, verse 5. When we learn more about Titus, we understand that this book becomes important because it teaches us about the redemption and how Jesus became human as a necessary step in the process. Let's be clear. Chapter 1 in Titus is about the choosing of the leaders. And Paul gives him instructions how to run the church strongly. And in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of this short book, he teaches how Titus' believers can lead a healthy and holy living life. We're going to be using the book of Ephesians in our message today. The author of the book is the Apostle Paul. And we know that it was the 10th book in the New Testament and that it was written around 60 to 62 AD. An important verse within this book comes from Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Paul visits Ephesians twice. The second time a rich silversmith then a terrorist found his business suffering greatly because people were converting to Christianity. He built silver for the idols and suddenly there, was so much, there wasn't so much need for these items. He wrote this letter whilst in prison in Rome to encourage them. Something to remember in the, in the chapters 1, 2 and 3, Paul greatly encourages the believers, calling them adopted sons of God and saying that there is a place for them. God picked the believers before the foundations of the world. What is grace? Let me try and explain it to you. I saw a man in a coffee shop the other morning being very rude to this young woman who was trying to help him with his order. He was demanding and disrespectful. He said many things to her, continually telling her to hurry up. Then I saw something wonderful happen. The rude man left the shop and the woman who was next in line began to talk to the young lady with words of comfort. When she had finished paying for her coffee, she gave the woman another extra 10 pounds. This was something she didn't have to do, but she wanted to do it. Then another happy thing happened. The man who followed the kind woman had seen the rude man's behavior and also with comfort to the woman when paying gave her another 10 pounds this is generosity where an individual doesn't have to give but gives because they want to this is what you call grace a gift freely given. Think of it as kindness. The Bible teaches us about God's grace. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. By God's grace we live in a world of remarkable beauty. And each one of us is offered God's love. This love and kindness is God's choice, a gift freely given. This is grace. 
The definition of God's grace is an act of kindness. Grace is the power of God made available to meet all our needs. The power of God is made available to you if you are struggling this morning with the issues of life. God's power is made available because his grace is sufficient. Let's go to the cartoon Christians. Is it you, Kevin? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 to 10 says, A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so I would not exalt myself. 8 Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. 9 But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. 10 So because of Christ, I am pleased in weaknesses, in insults, in catastrophes, in persecutions, and in pressures. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Thanks, Kevin. I like this verse because it reminds me that my weaknesses is a good thing. When I am too weak to do what needs to be done, then God's power is made perfect in my life. I am focused to reply and to rely on him. This is why grace is so important. How many gallons of water are in the ocean? How many grains of sand are in the world? even if you come up with the answer. My point is, God's grace is bigger than all these numbers. You could empty the ocean and the beach of water and plug every star out of the sky and God's grace has only just begun. Let's go to the cartoon Christians. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 6 to 7 King James Version, point 6. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's hear the word again, Christine. I Timothy 1 16 says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. 16 But I received mercy because of this, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate the utmost patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Thank you, Christine. Some of you look at the mess you were in and wonder how you will ever get back to where you were. I want you to know that God is restoring lives in the midst of their suffering. When I think of God establishing me, I imagine things of the house on the rock. No matter what comes against you, you can be established because God is grace. God offers you grace. This is important because our focus is not on the temptation, but to the deliverance of everlasting. If you don't feel God, if you don't feel like God is answering your prayers, be patient. One day, all your suffering will be gone. Our rock, our foundation is in grace. God's grace is sufficient in sin. It is greater than any sin. What can you tell me, Betty? 
King James Bible 520 Moreover the law entered, that the offence might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says, Where sin multiplies, grace multiplies even more. Living in God's grace counts for so many things. Surrounding absolutely. Walking accordingly. Walking in the light. Having grace towards others. Responding appropriately. Praising God for his grace. Preaching incre increasingly. Just thinking about it just for one second. This is what grace is. Yes, so the lesson has been given. The word has been shared. And you have listened. Thank you. Go now in peace. Go now in the name of the Lord.